Sunday morning to you all out there, and welcome into another episode of the Barking Brown Show. I'm Jacob, Mr. Casey Kinnaman, and Nick Carnes down below. We're brought to you, as always, by our friends over at Homage Apparel. Uh, I just felt it was appropriate for the David Njoku Angry Run shirt today. Don't know why, but uh, woke up, saw it, put it on, felt great. So here we are. Uh, if you're new, welcome to the channel. We've seen a lot of uh, subscribers to the YouTube recently, and we started over after uh, our, our split from Network 216 in March. And and we've got like 25,000 views since then. So it's absolutely ludicrous that you guys give that much of your time to us. So we we appreciate the heck out of you. So hit that subscribe button, give the thumbs up. If you want to support this show and help us make, continue to make great content, you can su subscribe to our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Barking Browns. Gentlemen, how are we? Doing great, man. Doing great. Like I was telling you before the show, I've gone into a little groove here on Sunday mornings. I wake up, I get out there on the trail, I get some miles in, kind of wakes up the brain. And uh, usually leads to like a more productive day and not as much brain fog as I would normally have on here. Yeah, you know what? I feel like even though it's it's June and we just had the longest day of the year, uh, it still can feel like football's forever. Like it just feels like football's forever away at this point. And so <laughs> shows like this, these little previews here kind of make it feel a lot closer. So every time we do one, I get a little more excited. Uh, we got a hell of a season coming. And so I, I'm really glad we can do these. Yeah, I, it, 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 I very much um, enjoy getting a ton of different perspectives and it can be difficult sometimes to take a step out and listen to some other perspectives uh, from outside of your circle that you're used to talking to. So that's what uh, I think we've done with this series. Um, going into episode two now of the 2024 opponent series, uh, we did the Dallas Cowboys. That's on the YouTube channel uh, if you wanted to check that preview for week one out next uh but now we're going to talk about some uh, jacksonville jaguars all right so jacob here was able to secure an excellent guest for us here today he is the host of the duval dive he writes for jaguars on si so ladies and gentlemen without further ado mr kyle nash what's, up, what's going on gentlemen Jacob. thanks for having me in guys listen i'm excited already i want the record to show that while i do talk a lot about the guys in Duval County. I'm a Niners fan first. I'm an analyst that lives in Florida normally. Apologize that I have something other than my studio background behind me. But the punchline is when I when the Jags were approaching playing the Browns last year, I believe I'm on record saying I picked your Browns to win that game to take wow. advantage of the numerous injuries that were in place for the Jags DBs because it was better in Joe Flacco handling business. The guy stole the comeback player of the year award from a guy that defied death. I mean, come on. So I just want to let you know I'm capable of neutrality. All right. Well, let's get <laughs> dig into the 2024 Jaguars. So the way I see it is they're coming into the season off like back-to-back -back Jekyll and Hyde seasons. 2022, you come in rough, finish strong, make a playoff run. 2023, you start off strong and fade towards that back half. And in my estimation, there's a lot of injuries that led into that, yeah. uh, mainly Trevor Lawrence, who, who was, who was uh, hampered. But when you see this 2024 iteration of the Jaguars, what is your expectation for them in this season? See, that, Casey, that's a good question. We just talked about this on the dive this past Friday. Me and my buddy Travis Holmes uh, from Big Cat Country, bing, I do that when I do plugs, so that's a thing. I, I'm not Love possessed it. by a robot or something, so, you know. But uh, when, we're, when we were talking about just this very thing about the expectations on the dive this past Friday on, you know, the YouTube channel that we were just now building, so I, I shout that out to give you guys respect, Jacob talking about rebuilding. But yeah. the thing is, the, the expectations aren't really a buzz, right? Two years ago, Doug Peterson just came in. Hey, be patient, everybody. It's a rebuild. They make the Bladen playoffs, right? They get the, oh, it was always the Jags attitude, making the playoffs, pulling off the big chargers, come back, all of that. And then people are like, oh, they're going to win 13 games. Now, let the record show. In both cases, I was neither as pessimistic nor optimistic. So this is me saying I could give you a good, proper perspective. But, yeah, the, the expectations, you don't hear a lot about it, mostly because I think a lot of the media and Duval devout out there aren't sure what to think. Yeah, everybody's freaking, oh, Calvin Ridley left. That deal didn't go how he wanted. And everybody was whining for a while. Then all of a sudden, they get, um, they get Morse from Buffalo to fill in the center spot, which was much maligned with how Luke Fortner's done the past two years. <laughs> They get some good receiver help in the form of Gabe Davis coming in. 
and um, they draft Brian Thomas Jr. in that first round spot. They get some other uh, pickups in the draft to bolster parts of the team that were in question, the offensive line, the defensive line. They get um, Eric Armstead to plug the middle to get more depth there, which is far more necessary. And regardless of what happens on the ends with um, uh, Walker and Allen there, they get locked up big contracts too. They extended Trevor and Josh Allen. All There's so many good things that happened that the Duval Devout's a little confused. Hey, we lost Riverly and we missed the playoffs. But we got all this. And it's looking a lot more like the 2022 season where the Jags offense were relying on Doug Peterson to pencil whip the other side, do something. They may not have a big guy that's down the field that can, that can you know, score on everything. Not everybody has a Justin Jefferson type, for example, right? But they have enough guys that are really good receivers that it's still a deep core and you could do a lot of good things. So it's it's looking more to me like that two season. And if they get Travis Entian more involved, you know, I, there's a whole thing we got. We call it mega here on the Duval Dive. Make Entian great again. And they've done the things there to make that balance offense to make that happen. So do you think that that serves them more to be more under the radar as they were in 22? As we now with Houston emerging and some people being kind of high on Indy, do you think that's like that, that serves this team's uh, purpose? Casey, you are two of wonderful points made in your questions already. Absolutely, they're under the radar. But over and above, one of the more disrespected markets in the NFL, right? I mean, Green Bay, Wisconsin's this little town. And Jacksonville, allegedly the biggest in land area. I know that's a ghetto rig stat, but whatever. The punchline <laughs> is the love they get, they've only got one guy in the dang Hall of Fame. And people keep disrespecting, you know, Jimmy Smith and Fred Taylor and all that. So under the radar is where they live anyway. And then with their upcoming, uh, you mentioned uh, Houston ascending. And rightly so, man. Listen, I was one of the people that was optimistic on then. And I still felt like a pessimist by the end of the year, giving them seven wins, right? So, yeah, Houston's a great point to add that in. Um, they're scheduled during the year. Not really a lot of headlining teams coming to town or travels that they make. If Aaron Charles Rodgers is still playing football late in the season when they actually face the Jets, that might be the one headliner game they got. But no Thursday nights, no Monday nights. Like, it's they have a very kind of, I would say, meh season scheduling-wise as well. Well, let's go to the defensive side of the ball. You, you touched on it. They they were able to ink uh, scary Josh Allen, as I refer to him. Uh, and, and you go and you sign <laughs> Eric Armstead. But you also have a former number one overall pick in Trevon Walker over there on the outside. What is your expectation for him this season? Oh, I mean, Trayvon himself, you've heard it coming out of minicamp. Both the coach Doug Peterson's excited. He's excited. There's, d- this will not be the only season last not double-digit sacks. Expect another one. I, I think that's that's pretty clear to happen. We're going to get another double-digit sack season out of him because they're really starting to figure out how to use him. I know there was a lot of moving him around and, and certain concerns, but people got to remember they have one of the most underappreciated linebackers in the NFL in the form of Foye Oluokun. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, he's regularly a top five in tackles the past two, three seasons, right? And everyone's like, oh, 23 ain't all that. I mean, he got a pick six to win, help win a game in, in, in no love. But then again, it was Carr. He throws a lot of picks. But the punchline is this, guys. That defense that was taking place last year was a big part of why this team started 8-3, and three, just as much as it, you, we want to put it on Trevor Lawrence or any of that. And now to have uh, Eric Armstead in the middle there, so they're going to be watching Allen. And as long as Eric Armstead's healthy, they're going to have to think about him. It's time for Trayvon Walker to eat. Um, I know that last year, and you kind of touched on it a little bit about some of the injuries that happened at defensive backs particularly at corner, but looking at this group going into the year, I mean, I like Ronald Darby a ton. We saw him some at, you know, with, when he was with the Ravens and uh, playing the Browns a couple of times there, I, I'm a huge Andre Cisco guy myself. Yeah. Uh, that was a draft crush of mine coming out a couple of years ago. So I, I, I like that, but you know, Darnell Savage, Tyson Kitt, look, it, do you feel if this group of, of corners and safeties are healthy, that they can be a very good group because i think talent wise they are up there with with some of those rooms across the nfl 
Well, Jake, I can't point out last year. The, the, the room's turned over so yes. much. But, you know, with, with everything going on, what helped them get to 8-3 and three was Darius Williams snagging a bunch of picks. The same was happening with Tyson Campbell, who is still there, you know, bringing in Savage to help in. The number of uh, – the, the it's the same way the receivers are deep. I can make an argument that the corners are kind of. The biggest challenge there is going to be adjusting to Ryan Nielsen, a defensive uh, 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 coordinator there because he's running a lot more man coverage. And and I think what that tells me is how much more they're going to trust that front. I don't I don't be surprised if you could get a linking in some way to Eric Armstead coming in with Nielsen uh, uh, being added on because the pressure that's going to need to be applied to maintain a man scheme like this, very important. Kyle, I, I think turnovers are, are – are, you mentioned Joe Flacco, and, and he, while – being as incredible as, as he was as a passer was also turning the ball over at an incredible rate. Yeah. And when, when the Browns and Jaguars played last year, you know, Trevor Lawrence w- was, was uh, unable to, to prevent the turnovers himself. Do you think, because it seemed like the Jaguars defense as a whole was playing really well in the first half of the season. And I, yeah. I think they were, as, I mean, to get day three, you have to be, do you think that the, the struggles were more because uh, Trevor was just so banged up and started turning the ball over more? Or, or do you think there was a, a larger problem at hand uh, with the defense that, that just led to that, that type of drop that we saw as the year went on? Yes. No, uh, I think there's <laughs> aspects of both there, Nick. Yeah. You make, again, a number of good points in there in both hats of the if and or there, right? So, uh, let, uh, let's let's mention too with the defense like the reason why and Travis and I both said this on the dive leading into that Browns game last year incredible fun one to watch regardless of the outcome but uh, and I can see why you guys are questioning the linebacker core with the way Njoku went off that yeah. particular Sunday buddy I get it but <laughs> um w- when it comes to any of that I-, I I feel like the injuries as you mentioned all over the place were a big factor and I'm not I'm not a Trevorologist, but I do think he gets entirely too much blame for everything that's going on around him, right? Consider this, guys. Week 17, if you believe Doug Peterson, week 17 was when they first got the O offensive line look they were hoping for after they brought in Ezra Cleveland in about week six or so. That's what? Let's do the math real quick. Like nine or ten weeks of having some o offensive front different than you were considering. Cam Robinson's injury. Um, Brandon Scherf had had to get banged up some. Um, Walker Little, much the same. Although he's considered a backup, I think he should be starting somewhere. But what do I know? You know, it, it's a whole thing where there was just so much rotation, and the guy that was on the roster the most, the guys that were on the roster the most was an amazing center. And Anton Harrison, who frankly should have been a top three vote getter for rookie of the year, but we don't respect the fat guys like that. Pardon my bias, but I got to bring him up. And then all of that, Luke Fortner, the guy that has been maligned from anything to fans, to pro football focus, any of that. If I mean, if you're into that whole Collinsworth stuff, whatever. But, you know, the punchline is universally, I don't care what church you go to or what, what school of thought you believe in, Fortner has been maligned uh, uh lately too and so that th- that's a number of just a, bu- a number of big things right there there have been a couple moments where trevor being trevor was a factor sure but when you consider how many dropped passes we talk about the chiefs and we should because they did lose a lot of games that way the jags have lost their share this is part of that hey we people are always under the radar in jacksonville right you know so, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of that's put on Trevor that isn't Trevor's fault. Of course, we'd like to see him improve, you know, for all the talk. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's going to come up, so I'll, I'll light the fire here. For all the talk of Trevor, how he doesn't, air quotes, deserve to be paid as much as he is. Folks, I'll tell you this. This is probably the only reason that he'll have the title of being one of the most highest paid. Well, let's go jump on the offensive side of the ball there. When I was looking at the additions, what you got the guys able to add to take this offense to the next level, obviously you lose Calvin Ridley. I don't know if that was a misplay or just it, it seemed weird, right? And just it the way that it went weird, down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you add Gabe Davis and then you draft Brian Thomas Jr. For what I'm seeing is they're showing they want to have a vertical game. They're showing they want to be able to, to be dominant down the field. 
And for a lot of that to happen, your offensive line has to be solid up front to allow Lawrence the time to uh, deliver those balls. And with Lawrence having a little bit of health issues over the back end, I think going and adding Mitch Morris at, at center, that's huge. Resigning Ezra Cleveland after you traded for him. But you touched on it, man. When you turn on that tape, Anton Harrison is I, – I think – I mean, just what he was able to do as a rookie – in one-on-one with, with some of the league's best, I think you have to be, feel very good about what his like upper bound limits are in the NFL. I'd start him at left tackle now. Maybe they will, Casey. I don't know. But, yeah, I, listen, if, if you want to give me a few seconds to stand Anton Harrison, I got you. Think of all the dudes he faced throughout the year, my mm-hmm. guy. Week two, you got to face Chris Jones, who's coming off fresh and yeah. ticked off that his team just lost to the Lions because he wasn't there. And they still really should have beaten the Chiefs that day if you look at the tape. We want to talk about these drops again. Calvin Ridley dropped two touchdown passes himself that very day. No disrespect to Patrick LeVon Mahomes the second, but his second pass of the day was to one of his own offensive linemen. This is what that defense was capable of, and this was kind of the protection that Anton Harrison was bringing against Chris Jones was amazing stuff i obviously the chiefs didn't have their best game travis kelsey was coming back i'm not saying that the jags were super bowl competent that's not where i'm going i am going that day was the first of a string of tough assignments mm-hmm. guys your defensive front is ridiculously good there in cleveland and anton harrison held his side pretty darn well so you know if that isn't better evidence to provide in this forum i don't know what else can you know <laughs> But I, like to get more to the crux of your question, Casey, I, I think you, you talk about the vertical game. And when Gabe Davis was brought in, I will admit bias up front, having covered Gabe Davis personally from time covering at UCF. Right now I'm doing that with the black and gold batterette. Bing! So I've had a number of times that I've gotten to talk to this guy. So likable, it's hard for me to not root for him just a little bit. That being said, I will also say, if you're trying to expect him to be a replacement for Calvin Ridley, it's a bad move. Here's the twist, guys. He was never meant to do that. The Jets, in my opinion, but why, by the tea leaves I'm reading, were looking for that extra element to come in the draft. Hence, mm-hmm. Brian Thomas Jr. The way he's been looking at camp, granted, nobody's wearing badge yet, so it don't matter. I got it. But he's doing all the things you expect the guy who's going to fill a role like that to do regardless of his age. So think about this, gentlemen. You brought in a a guy with leadership capability, right, to help lift up this youth, who if you look at his average completions, I think it's like one in every six passes to Gabe Davis is a touchdown. I think that's evidence of stretching the ball. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm not even talking about playoff games where he beat, you know, a former UCF DB in Mike Hughes to get five touchdowns in the game or whatever. There's an exhibit board in the Hall of Fame, for goodness sake, guys. Just drive down the road. So, but, but with all of that, Gabe Davis paired with BTJ, a Brian Thomas Jr. If you're a cool kid, you say BTJ just to give you guys a heads up. Okay. Right? okay. But thanks, thanks for that. Now, now, <laughs> now they've stretched things out. Evan Ingram, who's had a career year under Trevor Lawrence, even though he's such a bad quarterback, air quotes, you know, that, that's another aspect that, that with Doug Peterson's tutelage, you could pencil whip. And we, we are seeing an improvement in the offensive line mostly from guys coming back from injury. So then you make NTN great again. It's not just the vertical game, Casey, although they are concentrating that. The purpose of that is to make this offense balanced again, like you saw in 22, right? Well, I'll tell you what. If there's a team that that probably should have some – because the Gabe Davis move was was, uh, had a, was a very polarizing signing, right? I think you'd yeah. find opinions on both sides. But I would I would argue that based on the Jaguars history, like when the Jaguars signed Christian Kirk, there was a lot of doubt around that. He went and had a career year that next yeah. year. When he, Evan Ingram comes to Jacksonville, you know, he's kind of a cast off from New York. And then there he is catching over 100 balls last year. So yeah. – I, I, I think there is some some faith in in, in what the, there should be some faith in what the Jaguars are doing because clearly they know they know something about adding these guys. Uh, so I'm just curious between Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas Jr. Now obviously Brian Thomas is a first round pick, but if you had to to say who might have the bigger impact on the offense between the two, a BTJ as, as, as the cool kids call him, uh, uh, which one would you pick? Oh, the just in year one. Yeah, yeah. The reason why I'm going to pick Gabe is is won't be the stat sheet, but there's all sorts of things he brings that you aren't going to find there. For one, he was voted the hardest worker 
among his teammates in Buffalo. I, I wrote about some of this in his homecoming uh, with Jaguars on his side. Bing! So right. with all that in mind, like, I first of all, I already know this guy in, col- in college years ago came from a culture of no block, no rock. Seeing a re- receiver that's going to mix and get physical, beautiful stuff. We saw him emerge, maybe not as good as Justin Jefferson or um, – and the kid in Denver whose name is it's escaping me at the moment, he was also drafted that same year. They may have had more, more catches, but Gabe had more yards per catch over the period of time he saw the field. And granted, he wasn't out there day one, so they had more kind of, a, how you say, lift on him. Battled injuries the, the next year or two at times, so his numbers don't pop off the page, but also his leadership ability. And, and you mentioned Christian Kirk, too. A locker room with Gabe Davis and Christian Kirk in it is a disciplined locker room. So if the defense can follow of discipline up front, which I think they will now with Josh Sign, now with Eric Armstead, there's two leaders there. There was, and don't forget Foyer. If I forget Foyer, I would punch myself. I I, I couldn't look at look him in the face in the in the locker room. I'm sorry, Foyer. You know, these are guys that talk to the media, that do all the little things to make sure the guys are sharp. I think Gabe Davis will jump off the page or excuse me, won't chop off the page that way, but he'll have the intangibles. I think he's going to make the bigger difference. Mm -hmm. On the field, because he's going to be a lottery ticket that's going to hit for a lot of, air quotes, dollars in the forms of lighting up the scoreboard, BTJ has the potential to get a lot of cheap touchdowns on long balls. I was a a big Brian Thomas fan going into this draft, so I think that it, he was one of those like prospect fatigue guys who I thought kind of got knocked cl- as we got closer to the draft. Cause we've been talking about how good he was for so long. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, listen, like Trevor Lawrence has got the arm for that. And yeah. if you've got the arm for, for verticality, like Brian Thomas kid, like he's going to be like, I think, I, I think he makes a run at offensive rookie of the year. Like, I, I don't think that is ludicrous to say at all. Like, Uh, Just, just, I know that it's mostly a quarterback award, especially given this quarterback class and the six that went in the, in the top half of the first round. And so like, I understand that, but like, I think the dude gets some votes as long as, you know, he stays healthy and, you know, uh, there's all these, you know, a million different, different things. I want to ask about Trevor Lawrence's contract, but I want to ask about Dearness Johnson a little bit more first because we are big Dearness Johnson fans here. I'll never, I'll never forget when Baker Mayfield was out. It was Case Keenum. It was Thursday night. It was Denver, and Dearness Johnson won that football game. Like he was absolutely insane. And I know he's. There's been some things where he hasn't played as much as maybe we thought he was going to in Jacksonville or whatever. But like. How do you envision, like, where do you think the team sits on Dearness? Like, where do you sit? And what kind of thing do you think he could do this year? First of all, Jacob, thank you for the opportunity to be a Dearness Johnson stand on somewhere other than my pod. I, I don't mean to sound like a hipster, but I was looking after him and being impressed by him long before you thought it was cool, sir, okay? Right. I saw him in the like Shrine it. game coming out of you, and he impressed me there. And he gave me a nice little bit time to talk to me, even though I cover UCF. Figure that out, okay? Then on top of that, he ends up with the Orlando Apollos of the America, Alliance of American Football. I'm sure you guys know what that is, but for those who don't, the Orlando Apollos were the de facto champions under Steve Spurrier in a league that couldn't finish, and you got to laugh as Heinz Ward struggled as a head coach. I'm, 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 listen, I'm preaching to my audience here, okay? I have a yeah. Heinz Ward jersey at home. I don't have a problem with him, but if I get laughs from you guys, it's <laughs> <Burn> it. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the punchline is um, with all that in mind, Dearness Johnson to me has been an excellent support back. He impressed me with Cleveland as I knew he would coming to Jacksonville. Now here's the part where I get a little controversial in the front office and Trent Volke may not like what I have to say. You have obviously whiffed on Tank Bigsby just the way I thought you did when you drafted him that day two years ago. If he continues to whiff. Dearness Johnson's going to get that role as the second, air quotes, bigger back, right? Doug Peterson himself said that they don't want to run um, Entian into the ground because they're going to need him in his versatility should they get to a postseason scenario, right? I I said the postseason scenario thing, not not Doug. I'm just showing how I agree. But the punchline is this. The key to that is Dearness Johnson's ability to run bigger, stay healthier, come in with fresh legs, and – fantastic pass blocker as well something that you know 
the, the, the casual doesn't appreciate as much as, you know, we folk who, who dig the trenches, right? So I, I think the Ernest Johnson has the ability to make a huge impact. And, and, and when Travis Entian needs a blow or he needs to recover, he's going to get some snaps. And, and I'm excited for it. I want to touch on some of your depth because one thing that the Jags did last year is they drafted a couple guys that I was pretty high on in Parker Washington and mm-hmm. Brenton Strange. Do they play into the to the roles this year? Do the, will they will they be any? Because like, we look at Christian Kirk and you know you, you lose Zay Jones and Calvin Ridley, but then you add Gabe Davis and BTJ. So does Parker Washington figure into this rotation as a, as a prominent figure? I don't know if you've been watching the Duval dive, Casey, but <laughs> you absolutely seem to love a lot of our takes, man. We, yeah, we were big fans of Brandon and Parker Washington as well. Parker Washington dominated mini camp just like BTJ did. Brandon Strange was catching touchdowns from Mac Jones. Okay, okay yeah. let me let me make that clear, guys. This dude, who's part of the Make, make Entian and Great Again campaign for his blocking skills, is catching touchdowns in in mini camp from Mac Jones. Right? It, it, listen, nobody wants Mac Jones to start except for people at ESPN that want something to yell about and say some yeah. sort of stupid "I told you so." But the fact that let's say that Trevor needs a breather. And Mac Jones comes in to see this level of chemistry and him and Brandon Strange already is huge. And yeah, I'm, Brandon Strange is going to be one of those cats that 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 isn't going to be on the NFL top 100, but he is definitely going to be important to this offense. Think think Kyle uh, used check with the Niners, for example, yeah. right? Well, I just want to throw you a bone. Um, as we refer to him on here, it's McCorkle Jones. Put a little <laughs> respect on his name. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so the million dollar question, man, the, the the contract for Trevor Lawrence, there's been some stuff and some jokes out there. And have I partaked in some of the jokes? Yes, because like I'm a jackass, but like <laughs> it, it just depends on the day. But like there was this there's this like ludicrous uh, stat out there. They don't they hide a lot of them. I saw this graphic comparing Bortles and, and, and Lawrence in their first however many starts they don't show you like the completion percentage or the passing numbers. And for Trevor Lawrence, they're like extremely higher, but like some of his stats like line up with what Bortles did at the beginning of his career at Jacksonville. And I, I think that's just asinine to like compare those two. Cause they're, they're not the same player in any way, shape or form. Although I will say in uh, 2017 uh, when the Browns went out in 16, I, I always make this joke that if I'm not in the continental U S they go winless. And I was in Afghanistan that year. So oh. they, they, they lost, I watched all of them. I watched them lose all of those games. Uh, but my, uh, my fantasy team was the teenage mutant Ninja Bortles. So like, <laughs> that if was, you're, <laughs> if you're a fan of the good place, you know, a Bortles reference when you yes. see one, yeah. it's all good. I, I, that's one of my favorite things ever, especially when he finds out like on the good place, when he finds out that Bortles had, Bortles had been cut. Like yeah. that was probably one of the greatest moments on that show. It's it's one of my favorite shows. But where do you sit, man? Trevor Lawrence, that contract and in the overall direction of him. You know, and and I know you can't do this. And this is listen, guys. My day job is as I do a lot with data analysis and business intelligence. Meaning, if you say you use analytics, I can tell you if you're lying. And B, <laughs> I can tell when you're manipulating data to tell your story. And these people that want to compare Trevor Lawrence to Blake Bortles or to Daniel Jones are purposefully and just in completely intellectually. I'm trying not to curse right now is why I'm pausing. I'll go for it. it or just, it's, it's, it's my brand. I'm trying, you know, I got to <laughs> the other room, but um, you know, listen off, off there. I, it's cool. But no punchlines this though, guys, if, if there's just so much intellectual dishonesty surrounding those stats, if you, if I could, which I, I can't, but if I could, I would try to find some way to weigh or modify Trevor Lawrence's w- rookie year. I-, I don't know how to do it, and let's put it this way. I don't have time to put together the complicated model that would be necessary. But please understand the receiver core that was taking place when he arrived. Marvin Jones was the premier guy. No disrespect mm-hmm. to Marvin Jones because that dude had a hell of a career, okay? But he's your number one. You already got a problem, okay? Okay. Then the offensive line was not what it has become in the past two years, and and it's still a thing that needs work, right? Um, Carlos Hyde was your top back in Jacksonville at the time. 
We he did not get that. the carries because yeah. he couldn't stay healthy enough. Yeah. James Robinson did a good enough job, even, and then I think that ran him into the ground. That's why he got traded uh, uh, Entian's second year, which – Let's put it this way. Even Travis Entian himself has said, if you were going to miss a rookie year, that wasn't a bad one to miss. But um, And then Urban Meyer putting in what is legitimately, without hyperbole, one of the worst coaching performances in NFL history. Guys, coaching is so essential to a rookie quarterback, okay? I, I don't think I need to go any deeper than that. So when you consider all those things, yeah, his mum, his numbers as a rookie might look a lot more like Daniel Jones's, and he had to beat a tougher team than the Vikings in the playoffs after the officials allowed two pass and uh, pass, pass interceptions that were. Listen, I don't touch my wife like that on a date. That's all I'm saying. But <laughs> you know, and and still he overcame that. I don't think. That Daniel Jones is a comeback artist. I don't think that Daniel Jones is a leader. And yet somehow they're complaining more about Trevor's contract than Daniel Jones's. And I think that's because the, 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 the fan proper out there does not necessarily understand some of the NFL finances. And I don't blame them. It's complicated. You know, I'm not being like, oh, I'm better than you. No. Listen, if I wasn't paying special attention, I'd be confused too. I get it. You know. It's it's probably all the more credit to Trevor. I I, I think anybody that can I, I honestly you mentioned Urban Meyer and I think I just like pushed that that year of the Jaguars <laughs> out of my brain. So many and, people have. Don't feel bad, Nick. Right, and, and, and so to, to be able to go from that right to to you mentioned the comeback against the Chargers and then that like I don't forget the Jaguars gave the Chiefs a hell of a game there yeah. in the playoffs and and I know that things really fell apart. Uh, last year, but but there's a reason. There's an entire montage of Calvin Ridley drops. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. I, so honestly, I, I I feel like the the, the paying Trevor Lawrence and, and 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 building around him is is the right decision. So, I, and it seems like you're on the same page there. So so then I think ultimately the question is is are are the Jaguars going back to the playoffs in 2024? You know, it, it, here's the thing, and and and, and I know that if Travis hears this, he's going to throw something at the screen. But I still think this year's schedule overall is easier, okay? Um, last year had some certain low points. Listen, the Carolina Panther game coming up when it did may have had a little something to do with Josh Allen having the opportunity to break the record before week 18. I'm just going to throw it out there, okay? But a schedule per, on a per-opponent ab- appearance – the Browns were among the tougher games on the schedule last year, okay? And I feel like the midpoint for where the games are at is below where the Browns would be as an opponent. Like, And I, I, I kind of set that as limited. To, the Browns are a playoff competitive team in what is easily, if not the best, they are, but if not the best, the toughest damn division in football, which means you have to have depth as well. Guys, how often? has key player for any of you four t- your four teams missing at some point and what happens these teams typically still do pretty well even the Bengals were a threat without Joey Burr. I mean what are we talking about here you know yeah. and please link the difficulty of the schedule for the Jags last year from the first half to the back half right they yeah. beat they beat the Steelers with all their guys started missing guys you took advantage with your Brown squad, especially in Joku, right? Yeah. Um, the Bengals took six starters off and needed overtime. And the Ravens, listen, offensively by then, the Jags were just not that competitive on offense because of all the injuries. Christian Kirk was out. The line was in shambles. And still, that defense gave Lamar Demetrius Jackson a hard time, right? You know, so I, I think I feel like that's a piece that everybody's missing. The only real uh, um, face palming loss in my opinion, or losses, if fair, losing to Tampa was a little bit of a thing, but they were starting CJ Bathard, so you let that slide. That <laughs> Titans loss. If you're mad about that as a Jags fan, not only because it took you out the playoffs, you let you let that team beat you. Yeah, I get it. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up here with, with a nice little bow. And I'm, I'm going to save the hardest question for last. This is this is hard-hitting journalism here. How pumped up are you for Deadpool and Wolverine? 
Oh man, see, listen. I mean, I, I, I this just pure accident. I wore the T-shirt. I I, I honestly pulled out what was at the top of the suitcase. But yeah, man, let me tell you, Hugh Jackman. I don't care if he's Canadian, American treasure. Okay, Ryan Reynolds is already a Canadian treasure. <laughs> But if he comes to the door and knocks and asks for my wife, I'm just going to go and play some Warcraft for a while and let you know. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> so, no, I, I mean, all that joking aside, man, listen, all, oh, so many cool things from that movie coming out. They're going to get the MCU back on track because just some of these movies have not been as great. Um, I'm even hearing hints of a, of a juggernaut uh, reunion here. That's going to be fun. Oh, yes. Man, listen, like, it. it, it you can tell I'm having trouble forming the thoughts to reach my excitement. I don't go to like, we don't go to the movies much anymore because right. I, I just don't. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm old and worn out. and like, <laughs> it, it takes too much out of me, but like, I'm going to the movies for it. Like it's expensive too. Like that's practical. It is. It is. You know? Yeah. I think, I think our, we had a, we have a movie theater in Nelsonville. That's still relatively, I'm down in Athens. But uh, we have that's still relatively cheap. Last I checked, they were still only doing uh, five dollars for oh, movie tickets. There it is, um, and you can get like a dollar hot dog. So like, right. oh snap, you know, okay. It's, it's like a twenty minute drive for me, and they also have a giant arcade in there. So mm -hmm. like, you know, they but I got to make a day out of it. So like, I've got to have a day. <laughs> They did the new Guardians really well. I was super yeah. pleased by that. And so I'm hoping that they come right back. With, I mean, how could you? Deadpool and Wolverine has to be. I, I can't wait. I, I think the the, the movie I've, I saw the most ever in theaters was the original Deadpool. Because sure. it was just such a different <laughs> movie at the time. And that was when Marvel was really in their wheelhouse. So, so Kyle, uh, amen to, to, to getting Marvel back on track. Because we are, we're due for a, a real good one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and listen, that one had Chris Hemsworth to rely on. I feel like if you put Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman together, you kind of get a Chris Hemsworth element. You mm. get the comedy, you get the ruggedness, you get the good looks and the and all the you know stuff mm. that you want out of a good comic book movie. There, um, maybe listen, it's not going to get Oscar gold, but it's still going to be a great time, and that's totally. what we're looking for, right? That's all that matters. Nick, see us out of here, brother. With that being said, Kyle, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. If you want one more Bing, feel free, sir. Let them know where they can find you. I'll, I'll do it. Whenever I do the outro, I go ahead and skip the Bing because we line it all up. But listen, guys, an honor, joy, and privilege to come in and bark some browns with you and Jaguars in particular here as well. But... Uh, I'm Kyle Nash, the student of the game. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and threads at the SOTG. Find me on Facebook as the student of the game. Check out my writings with the Jaguars on this side, the black and gold banneret covering UCF, and the three-point conversion where I cover the Orlando Magic, as well as my other podcast, the student of the game. Find that on Wednesday night, 9 Eastern, and then the Duval Dive, 11 a.m. Eastern. Find all of that on any of your podcatchers if you don't have time to do it live. And gentlemen, had a great time with you, if ever. You need more? Come find me. But until next time, guys, class dismissed. Clearly a man of many talents. This has been a Barking Browns preview. Jacksonville Jaguars episode. Nick, that's Kyle. He's Casey. That's Jacob. Go Browns. Yeehaw, Spider-Man. <laughs> ah.